thank you for attending this hearing and allow me to uh, bid welcome to you all. Today we will be discussing free movement and the increasing pressure that it's, it's, it is put under by cross-border crime. We are hosting this hearing to contribute to this crucial debate. It is a crucial debate because free movement is the cornerstone of European cooperation and without the EU does not exist. There is a clear need to increase the understanding of the benefits that free movement creates for Europe and its citizens. However, to do that, we also need to be honest about the challenges that arise from the free movement. If we do not address these challenges and find effective solutions, the public support for free movement will be undermined. We are facing an enormous challenge from cross-border crime and for the national politician, reintroduction of border controls is often the easy solution to the problem. As you all know, last year Denmark, my home country, made the headlines of newspapers all over Europe with a political agreement to do exactly that. I personally regret the agreement, but I understand and agree with the need to address the problem that they were trying to address. Now the decision has been rolled back and the debate has calmed down, but we must not forget the reason for the agreement and we must not think the citizens' worries have disappeared. European citizens are generally concerned with cross-border crime. And though closing the borders is blatantly the wrong solution, the citizens' concern is real and should be addressed. The feeling that crime pays, that perpetrators can travel freely around Europe, rob people's private homes with violent means, engage in criminal networks, stealing in everything from petty crimes to drugs, people, weapons, and get away with it, is a huge threat to our societies and to the EU as such. There can be no democracy and no community when the trust in the rule of law is undermined. Impunity is the glue dissolvent of the social material that binds our societies together. But closing the borders is the wrong solution to the problem because it simply doesn't work. It might seem like a persuasive solution because you can literally show that you are doing something as a politician. But there's no way to control every single, single stretch of border. And when that is the case, criminals will always be able to find other ways around the controls. Not to mention that the people you might catch red-handed at border controls will mainly be the small fish who can always be easily replaced. This is, of course, why the Union has developed a stronger and a stronger effort in police cooperation. The question is, are we doing enough? That's why we're here today, to learn from and get inspired by some of the experts, so that we can find solutions that actually work and that can be explained to our citizens by bringing about real results. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, welcome. And now allow me to give the floor to my good friend and colleague from the VVD in Holland and member of the Liebe Committee in the European Parliament, Mr. Jan Mulder. Thank you uh, very much. Welcome to you all as well. I um, will not add very much to what uh, Mr. Rode has said. I have come here especially this afternoon to listen. I can only say that the subject has interested me for a long time. I was in 1994, I was a member of the first inquiry committee of the European Parliament and the subject of that committee was how to prevent fraud in transit traffic. In 1992 we had opened the borders and in 1994-1995 it became evident that it was not only a blessing, there were also some negative aspects to it. So this inquiry committee was established for a year we interviewed all kinds of people from all over Europe, what do they notice? And uh, yeah, in the end, we came up with a voluminous report of conclusions. I remember the most prominent one for me is that, what we already expected, 
it is impossible for 27 individual countries to maintain law and order in uh, Europe. We must have a European cooperation. And in this respect, the report called for a European public prosecutor. I am still convinced that some kind of organism like that is necessary. There must be more cooperation between the European authorities. From everyday life, I, last year I introduced an amendment in the European budget saying that part of the budget should be used to combat transborder criminality. And uh, it was adopted with a wide margin, and I hope that the Commission will implement this amendment from the Parliament and that we will do something more about it, because I myself, I am still enthusiastic about the European ID, but it does not help very much when we find every day in the newspapers reports that because of the free borders and insufficient control, there is increasing criminality in supermarkets and everywhere. We have to do something on a European level. How we will exactly do that, I hope to f I will find part of the solution this afternoon. So once again, welcome to everybody. And I think the first speaker this afternoon is Mr. Joachim Nunez de Almeida. And I'm sure I don't pronounce his name correctly, but you probably understand who he is. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I um, am a head of unit at the Commission in charge of uh, exchange of information and police cooperation. And I would give you briefly a state of play of where we stand on a series of projects connected to the subject that uh, brought us here today. Um, we've got this year, it's going to be quite a busy year in terms of um, policy initiatives by the Commission in this area. We are going to come up with, in December, uh, the European Information Exchange Model, which is like uh, the state of play of uh, information exchange in the EU at this stage, information exchange between police services from member state to member state. We're talking about the bilateral dimension here, not so much the, the Europol dimension, to which I'll come in a second. Um, and with some recommendations about uh, the future here, in particular how we see uh, the future of the Prum decisions and the uh, Swedish initiative. But I'll come back to this in a while. There's also going to be the reform of Europol and CEPOL, uh, largely because of the political need to bring these two agencies uh, under the uh, correct Lisbon format. But we're also taking the opportunity of having a look at how these two agencies are operating to see uh, how they could be amended in the understanding that we're not going to reform the agencies every two, three years, but we should give the agencies a regime that should last for a horizon of 10, 15 years, I would say, uh, on the top of my head. We are also, and that connected to the refurbishing of the legal base of CEPOL, um, going to come up with a policy on training training of law enforcement, training of police officers or other people connected to European police cooperation. Uh, the judgment there being that uh, at this stage there's already quite a considerable acquis in Europe of uh, police cooperation and exchange of information matters, agencies, etc. And that one of the issues is that these things are not known enough by the people that need to know them. And if you don't know something, you don't use it. And so, um, we're also going to do something uh, there. And then in 2014, we're supposed to, according to the Stockholm program, produce a communication on police cooperation um, in the uh, strict sense of the word, in terms of operational police cooperation, uh, and not so much focalizing on the information exchange bit uh, on which we're going to deal this year. 
Uh, my unit gave me a lot of paper uh, that I could, that I don't think I'll have time to read all this uh, this afternoon. How, how long how, uh, my intervention has been scheduled? You have 20 minutes. Okay, that well. You are lucky I didn't look exactly when I, you started. <laughs> okay. So, it's uh, about 20 minutes from now. Fine, 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 fine. Thank you. Um, I'll start with police cooperation. Um, it covers in particular under Schengen, which is probably the main instrument we have there, mutual assistance for the purposes of preventing and detecting criminal offences, cross-border surveillance, cross-border pursuit, communication of information in specific cases for the purposes of preventing future crime and offences against or threats to public policy and security, exchanging information for the purpose of carrying out effective checks and surveillance at the external borders, seconding liaison officers, stepping up police cooperation in border regions through bilateral arrangements and agreements, and setting up the Schengen information system. And since the build-up of the Schengen Aki, we have also seen the development of the Prüm Council decisions, which are just not just connected with information exchange, but also with police cooperation. Um, and on the basis of the Prüm decisions, you can have joint patrols, assistance to tourists on the street at police stations, security of tur tourist sites, common traffic controls, accompanying supporters, accompanying dangerous transport, support during major events, sending material together with operators, and setting up joint command and co coordination centers on an ad hoc basis. But initiatives have not just come from the above. We have also quite an interesting development at the internal borders of the EU, which is the establishment of bi- or multilateral police and customs cooperation centers, what we call PCCCs, i.e. in many cases, and this shows that there is a real need, the police forces of neighboring member states have got together and established joint uh, centers at borders. Uh, which have had a great importance for the regional cross-border cooperation uh, along our internal borders. Uh, and it, this is a development, a, a bottom-up development that the Commission sees also with uh, quite a lot of interest. But we're looking at all these things in terms of, uh, we're starting a policy-making exercise uh, on police cooperation in, to, in order to find out what the problems, needs and improvement potential is. And in the future, in the near future, we, we will consult relevant stakeholders, including your, the parliament, agencies, the member states, in order to better know the problems, the needs and the improvement potentials to see where to build up from Schengen, Prüm and the PCCCs, so as to submit in 2014 a communication on the improvement of customs and police cooperation in the EU. So that's for police cooperation. On information exchange, um, as I said, we're going to do a communication this year. Um, exchange of information presently takes place between CIS and the Cyrene Bureau. There are other channels within the EU that allow police authorities to exchange information. The main other channels are Europol and Interpol. There are also plenty of bi other arrangements such as bilateral liaison officers, the police cooperation centers I spoke to about before, and specialized networks on given areas of crime like the financial information units. And as I said at the beginning, to present the state of play of the cross-border exchange of information um, and, on, and recommendations out on how it could be improved, we will issue a communication at the end of this year, addressed to the Parliament and to the Council. We're not thinking of presenting any far-reaching new initiatives. The reading coming from the ground is that information exchange between police forces in the European Union, by and large, works okay, rather well. I mean, of course, there are many things that could be improved, but uh, uh, we're not presented with a nasty uh, picture with full, plenty of dysfunctionalities. 
But we will make still some targeted recommendations that result from a thorough assess assessment of how the existing uh, systems work, in particular the Swedish initiative and um, the Prüm decisions. Now, on the reform of Europol, uh, which is uh, this agency of the EU that assembles and disseminates information in support of uh, law enforcement action in the EU, located in The Hague, that I'm sure you all know. Uh, we're thinking of revising the legal framework to address this need of bringing it un under the Lisbon umbrella. And we are thinking of improving the mechanisms of the provision of information by the member states to Europol. The situation is getting better, but it's still far from optimal. Uh, there is no easy panacea to solve this problem, which is largely a, a cultural issue, but there is more that could be done to improve, and we're going to try anything that works to see if things get better here. We also think that we have to reinforce the mechanisms to make sure that the information found by Europol is followed up with action at national level, because it's at the national level that you have the coercive measures that could put Europol's uh, findings into action. We think also that Europol should gather and analyze information from the internet in order to obtain a more comprehensive ima image of cybercrime and threats. In We support the uh, existence of a cybercrime center at Europol. We think that Europol should be allowed the access to financial means to support law enforcement operations within the member states and coordinate operational activities in specific investigations as it does already in the area of Euro counterfeiting. We also think that Europol has at the present stage a data management system which is probably too cumbersome and too inflexible in terms of type and number of databases and that while keeping the strength of the data protection and confidentiality rules that have made uh, Europol's reputation, we think that this area also needs to be revisited in order to render the system more agile and to allow Europol a better support to the law enforcement of the member states. Um, we also think that we need to improve the situation as far as the exchange of information between Europol and third countries is concerned. The present system according to which we, there is a need to have a formal uh, agreement to exchange personal data with third countries is too cumbersome. Uh, a serious uh, criminal intelligence agency for the EU cannot wait years and years to have an international agreement with partners such as Turkey and Russia. But of course, uh, the data protection uh, guarantees have to be safeguarded. And what we're thinking is to find out systems that would allow that data protection authorities would authorize uh, ad hoc transfers of data or exchanges of data with third countries rather than a rigid definition of once and for all that a third country is okay from a data protection point of view. Uh, and we think that this could improve the situation quite a lot. Uh, there's also good news for the European Parliament on the reform uh, institutionally, in the sense that uh, we think that the Parliament should have a stronger, the Parliaments, because the Lisbon Treaty talks about the European Parliament and the National Parliaments, should have stronger oversight about the policies, the administration and the finances of Europol. It's up to the European Parliament to decide how it wants to structure its control with the National Parliaments. I think these are the major highlights of the, uh, well, no, finally, and last but not least, we also think that there needs to be better clarity about the role of each of the agencies, uh, Europol, Frontex, and Eurojust, so as not to have overlaps and uh, confusing um, mandates in the future that could lead to, could lead to um, uh, damaging competition. We're also going to revise CEPOL's mandate 
in order to update it uh, and bring it more in conformity with the Lisbon framework. And one of the ma major changes that we suggest for the CEPOL framework is that the training provided by CEPOL should not be addressed only to senior police officers, but to whoever are the police officers that need to be trained on European matters, which is not necessarily just the um, senior police officers. I also said that we're going to come up with a policy on training, which will say largely what can be done by CEPOL and what can be done at the national level. And we see the need to improve in four areas. We think first that we need to define what is, I mean, first of all, there's the training on what we call like general institutional matters. And with this, I'm not thinking about things like the Stockholm program or, uh, or the like, which are probably of no concern to the average police officer. But we think that we need to make sure that the police officers that need to know are aware of what Europol is, are aware of what Frontex is, are aware of what Schengen is, etc., etc. That would be sort of the general knowledge, that w what we call strand one. Strand one, two of the policy would be the development also of the bilateral uh, knowledge. The, 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 the Portuguese police needs to know more about Spain than it needs to know about Estonia. And there needs to be better education about what your bilateral, which is probably the police force that you contact on a more regular basis, need to, uh, need, w what you need to know there. Th the third strand of the European training scheme is the improvement of the uh, training on what has been considered as the criminal priorities of the EU, in particular within the framework of the EU policy cycle, by identifying what are the criminal priorities at EU level and then making sure that either CEPOL or national training institutes give training on those matters that have been considered as uh, important. And finally, the uh, external dimension of training, we also think it's quite important. Uh, for first, the training of police forces of the EU that are sent for peacekeeping missions or, uh, yeah, peacekeeping missions around the EU or somewhere in the world. And uh, the training of police forces of third countries in uh, things where we think that Europe could have a value added in uh, improving the standards of the police forces of our neighboring or whoever key partners they happen to be because the security of the EU as the organized crime threat assessment shows doesn't start at Europe's borders but it's uh, it starts I mean the, the world the crime market is the world market I mean there's no European crime there's a world crime that acts in Europe so the interaction uh, with the rest of the world is probably as important as the development of the mechanisms of cooperation between our member states and between our member states and the centralized um, agencies. I think, I hope I didn't go over my... I would stop here. There are uh, several members of parliament that could take an example to you. <laughs> they usually overrun their time. You didn't. Thank you very much. Thank you. You already mentioned in your uh, speech Europol. We are lucky that we have a representative of Europol, Mr. Oting, so we will hear it from the horse, his mouse. What Europol thinks about the whole situation. Please, you have the floor for 20 minutes. Sir. Thank you very much, and I'll try also, um, like my good colleague from the Commission, to uh, keep the 20 minutes. Thanks, first of all, to uh, Jens Rude and Jan Molde for inviting us uh, for, for this seminar. I think it's an excellent idea to also, from time to time, stop and look at what is actually happening in our union and in the Schengen area. Also grateful for Joachim stating a lot of the things uh, which is going on in, uh, in the more overall and the strategic area and the law. So I will instead try to keep to, to more simplistic uh, and maybe more realistic uh, day-to-day uh, -day, uh, changes that we might need in, in this area. First of all, I think that it's crucial for the Schengen and for the European Union, uh, basically, to that, that the people have trust in that they are secure inside the Union. And if the only thing they read day out and day in that there is criminals robbing and stealing, and that is because of the internal borders, we will lose this public support, of course. And, and, and I think this is crucial 
not to lose this support because it might be a perception, but it's actually a real perception sometimes. And I think that we have measures that we need to also step up in this area. And that's why I think it's, it's also very welcome to have this <coughs> seminar. There is increased migration problems, which is uh, actually uh, pressing our outer borders, especially in the south. We also see, which is very real, a changing face of organized crime. Mobile organized criminal groups and networks are, are, are really mobile inside the Union, and they are very swift, and they are very easy to adapt to legislation and to habits by the law enforcement. We also see that, that we have a lot of perpetrators which are actually with no value for the organization because the real valuable people, they will keep hiding. And I think that we need to shift from reactive policing to more intelligence-led policing. Um, I think that, 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 that the trust can be regained, and I think that the Schengen system uh, is actually a vital tool to this, but I also think, to be quite honest, that it's a bit outdated. Uh, I do not think that the Schengen requires a European FBI. I think that policing is key for the member states, that coercive power should be kept in the member states, and I think that this is the way we are brought up, and this is also the way why we have trust in the system that we are getting arrested by our own police in the member states. But of course we need to exchange information much, much better than we do in order to pinpoint the perpetrators, no matter where they come from. What can we do in order to, to add, let's say, added value to the to the system. When Schengen was implemented, the Schengen system was made to have some kind of compensation so that you could actually catch people inside the Union who was wanted and you could also prohibit people from leaving the European Union if they were wanted. The Schengen system is basically a hard information system. What you put into the Schengen system is people that, is, that you want because you want to arrest them. They have committed a crime or a gun who has been stolen, or a car who has been stolen, or a document which is falsified. So it's about thing that has happened. What I think we need is more information about what will happen. It's not very much of value to know that a person has been stealing goods, but it's much more interesting for the police and law enforcement to know if he's going to steal while he's crossing the borders. And even though we do not have borders internally in the EU, the police have all the possibility to make random checks or to stop uh, foreign cars or national cars in order to check if there is anything against the rules. So if you stop a, a high ace van in the middle of nowhere in a random area, rural area in Denmark with four youngsters, it's, it's plausible. But if the only thing that you get out of stopping them is, is, is an idiotic information which is outdated, then you might not react as a police officer. But if you, for instance, have the information in front of you that this car and the person in the car has also been arrested maybe two weeks earlier uh, out of Hamburg, but there was no really conviction, but they were seen in suspicious circumstances and all other information linked to this, you might act differently as a patrolling officer. You might then query a bit where they live, where, where they, if they have stayed somewhere, you might even open the trunk and see if they're stolen goods. So um, let's look a bit on this Schengen system, how it works now. If you have an example, a police officer checks the uh, Schengen information to see whether a vehicle is, is stolen. If there is a hit, it only triggers a national contact between the question country and the country where the car is stolen. No multidisciplinary approach, nobody else. So you get nothing more, nothing less. The car is stolen. But is this always interesting? I think not. But in the 90s, when we created the Schengen system, Europol was not even at the map, I think. It was Europol Drugs Unit somewhere hidden in a small building in Maastricht in a project team. And there was no really uh, power, or there was no uh, really role for, for, for Europe, uh, Europol. But what has changed since that? A lot has changed. Europol is now a full-fledged uh, agency which is located in, in The Hague, approximately 800 staff out of them, more than 150 from the member states, liaison officers, and not just police officers, but all from all, let's say, law enforcement agency with some kind of coercive power in the member states. For instance, Italy has four law enforcement agencies. They have the police, Carabinieri, Garda Finanza, and the Customs. 
They will be represented in Europol. So this is a multidisciplinary approach, and they have access to all the information back home. We have a secure link and a secure network, which is called Siena, to all the member states. And then we have what is most important for you to know. We have the European Information System, Europol Information System, EIS. And this is the one that I will advocate a bit for, that we might use in a more aggressive way and a more proactive way in the years to come. We also have a very, very, very strong data protection regime, probably the strongest I've ever seen as a police officer any place. And we are monitored daily by our data protection office and also by a joint supervisory body, which will take care of that we do not store information that is illegal and we do not misuse any information. And to my knowledge, in the 10 years that we have existed, we have never had a report that uh, addresses uh, any misconduct. What do we have to offer also? We have more than 100 analysts who look into all the various information that is passing through Europol. And we have uh, more than 13, 14,000 cases each year on organized crime. We also a center of expertise in many areas. Joachim mentioned that we probably will host the European Cybercrime Center. Hopefully, a decision will be taken uh, actually in this month, I guess. And um, we are, normally we work in serious organized crime, counterterrorism, and cybercrime on a European scale. And all of these crimes affect all the countries. And we, of course, have to work in a number of layers because some of the crimes we need to have to share all the information instantly with member states and law enforcement. Other ones we keep more secure because we have identified the kingpins the top of the network, and we can, of course, not make this available for everybody in the law enforcement area because we also face that in some uh, areas we cannot trust all of the information that we share. Europol has access to the Schengen information system, but with huge limitations. I'm not um, really familiar why the reason for these limitations are there, but we are actually not, it's not possible for us to have an automated search. We also have to go to the member states every time we have a hit or any time we, we obtain anything in the Schengen system. And actually right now, in this big, big building of Europol with all these officers, we only have one computer with access to the Schengen information system. So we can do it uh, manually, and I can assure you that this is not the most cost-efficient way of using this tool. So, but anyway, in 2011, we made 572 manual checks, which triggered only two relevant hits. But for instance, from our colleagues in Interpol, they have the same database structure on a global scale. They have red notices. Red notices is people who are wanted because they are wanted. There is an arrest warrant globally. They have 24,000 wanted on this list, and they dropped it to us, and we cross-matched it because we. Strangely enough, we can cross-match it with Interpol, but not with another European institution agency like Schengen. And we have many, many hits in this. So there is, of course, some kind of dynamic, and there is also an added value in doing this. Let me come with an example that I hope that you can understand. If you have a Europol analyst work on a criminal network involved in the facilitation of, let's say, illegal immigration, together with five member states, the group smuggler, smuggles irregular migrants to the Schengen zone. The criminal provides the immigrants with travel documents with valid visas issues on false, false basis with the help of a corrupt consular official in some country. The five member states share a limited amount of criminal intel with Europol analysts process in the EIS. Europol analysts see a connection with non-EU states. They request and receive substantial amount of personal data on smugglers who are residing in this non-EU state but are active inside the Schengen area. The info is not available of the Schengen states and includes personal data about accomplices, contacts, and number of falsified ID documents. Consultation of the SIS by Europol leads to positive answers. Some of the smugglers are wanted for arrest, Article 95, and some have been included in SIS for the purpose of surveillance, Article 99. And all the falsified documents numbers are checked in the SIS for stolen or misappropriate IDs, Article 100. Europol then asked the concerned Sarin Bureau for the additional information, which will be included in the information system. Now available for the first time to all investigators around Europe working on similar targets, and will be run against other databases and will provide further leads in ongoing investigation around 
in Europe. My conclusion is therefore that if you coordinate Europol's information system with the Schengen information system, you add value to two tools which are already existing. But what is missing? Europol analysts to include information received from non-Schengen states and result of their analysis directly in CIS so that Schengen states can benefit from Europol's added value. And access to Article 98, persons wanted for the uh, purpose of a prosecution which is now the European arrest warrant. In this example, Europol analysts could have worked on targets without knowing that they were subject, for instance, to a European arrest warrant. We could actually work on perpetrators which were wanted from another country and there was an EAW on it, and we didn't know that because we do not have this access. So we have to read maybe an open sources newspaper to learn that he might be uh, a search for prosecution. So this is, of course, not, I would say, the most productive use of two tools. Another uh, example I would say is that, do we need more databases or more information, or do we actually have the most of these information? I would argue that we have most of the information. This is also behind the Stockholm program. It's the availability of the information, because if a police officer from Lithuania makes a report in his national system, that he has a suspect for one thing or another thing. It is, in theory, available if he makes it available. If he puts it in the Schengen system as a discrete surveillance, yes, it's available for some. If he puts it in the European information system, it's available for other ones. But there is no match. So this is just about using cleverly the existing tools in a more progressive way. The same, actually, is for cars and for stolen documents and other uh, areas. And uh, let's take another example. A police officer is checking the SIS to see whether a vehicle with foreign license plates are listed as stolen vehicles. He'll do this randomly, let's say, in Denmark. If he simultaneously searched the EIS, if he did that, it would have brought him in contact with all other member states and Europol analysts who might have a leak connected to the license plate. The car might have been involved in drug trafficking in Spain, related to a murder in Italy, or to a trafficking in human case in France. But this is in another system. and He just sees that it's stolen in Germany. Again, we miss to connect the links because we do not do it automatically. Is the time right for change? Yes, I think it is, actually. We have a discussion right now. And um, I think that uh, there is a number of reasons why we should actually address this and why I think that the European Parliament should have a closer look. Schengen is challenged by the changing face of organized crime. You cannot just rely on a reactive system which tells you about what has happened. Highly mobile and flexible groups operating in multiple jurisdictions and criminal sectors, we see this every day. Two weeks in Denmark, off to Sweden, then to Spain, steal, rob. Drug dealers trafficking in human beings, smuggling in weapons. There is a lot of these mobile groups. And a lot of them is now seen also in rural area. And Mr. Mulder and I, we discussed this earlier, that it, where he lives in a remote and very normal, peaceful area, they suddenly see this. And this makes us all uncertain and that lower our, life, uh, the, the, our quality of life. And I think that we should react on this. Another change is the criminal groups. When I was a young police officer, we always structured the police after commodities. A criminal will only deal with a robbery, or he would uh, be a thief, or he would take uh, cannabis, or whatever. Now organized criminal groups are poly criminal. They are there where the profit is, so they are much, much more adaptable. You cannot put them into compartments and specialized areas, because they will be where the money is. We also uh, noted in uh, our uh, organized crime threat assessment for 2011 that there is uh, increased control of external borders have resulted in irregular migrants turning to organized criminal groups instead to enter the EU. As soon as they see one way of getting into the EU, they turn to another way of getting into the EU. And if they get in with the organized criminal groups, they will have to remain inside EU below the radar. They will not go to the normal asylum procedure because then they will be kicked out directly. This is what, don't, not what they want. So they will be below the radar. So we are creating a subculture with people nobody knows anything about. The when police does not. 
many, many different countries, but West African countries, we see a lot of them. We also see them from the Far East. Last year, we also witnessed how organized criminal groups exploit the social and political unrest in North Africa following the Arab Spring and facilitated the movement of thousands of Tunisians into Italy. And there was uh, also a team sent to Lampedusa. I think that the Schengen information system is also evolving. Now we have the European arrest warrant replacing Article 98. The future of Schengen 2, the SIS 2, will able to include more objects, including biometrics. Proposal for a directive of the European investigation order could repeat place part of the Schengen Convention, and legislative package presented by the Commission recognizes the importance of the organized crime factor in the Schengen matters and proposes to amend a Schengen border code. All these proposals will contribute to increase the efficiency of the Schengen system. And our agency does also have a change now, and this is why the Commission is working hard to prepare a regulation, a whole new legal framework, which will then be discussed in the Parliament and the National Parliament and here it's very, very important that the Parliament also looks at what is the need for these, let's say, um, coordination bodies in order to fulfill the full task and give the added value to the member states. And here we have a number of, of topics, a number of areas where we are too limited in the way that we work. And this is not, you know, a mystery. We work basically on the same uh, legal framework that was back in '94. But the world has changed since 94. Just look at yourself. Where were you in 94? <laughs> and where are you now? So there is a change. And this is the same with crime. So there is a need to modernize. And in, in, in Europol, we have actually addressed this by listening to our member states. So when we drafted the last serious criminal threat assessment, we identified, and actually our police chiefs in the COSI identified, that mobile criminal groups are one of the most dangerous criminal phenomenon in these years. So we have set up a project on this, and we work with dedicated teams. So my conclusion is clear. I think that we have some of the tools already in Schengen and the European information system. We just need to make them comply. I think that when we upgrade Schengen, and you upgrade Schengen anyhow, think in the proactive matter, not just the reactive matter. When the regulation for Europol is changed, please include the measures that is needed for Europol to also facilitate the member states. And based on this, and this is really small adjustments, I think that we can also support the trust which is needed in order to support the solidarity of the European Union. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much. And then we have now time for discussion. We are even ahead of uh, schedule. Who would like to take the floor? Bill, would like to... Bill, Newton, Bill, Newton, I didn't expect to be the first, but th thank you, Jan. First of all, thank you to the two speakers. Could we have a copy of their notes? Because it was full of detailed information. To try and make detailed notes as they both spoke is, was quite impossible. So if, if we could have a by email, that would be uh, probably helpful to everybody. Uh, mm. Yes, if if yes, we know who everybody is here, but that's, a, that's another question. But at least my name is known. I'd love a copy. Um, ju just just a few things uh, to comment on that. Um, I don't know if Cecilia Malmstrong is the commissioner who's the boss of this. When, when she was first voted into her job by the parliament, almost the first thing she did, she came across to me and said, Bill, I'm very keen about your idea of a European FBI. So from the very top, uh, in the Commission, I can tell you that the idea of a European FBI is very much being thought about. Then, of course, there's an enormous amount to do. And, and I would say, in the friendliest terms to our, uh, to our policeman who gave an excellent presentation, you're not succeeding, you're losing. If you look at the vast amount of international crime that is hitting Europe in terms of drugs pouring into our countries, illegal immigrants pouring in, counterfeit goods pouring in, crime on the internet, which is growing all the time, we all see it every day on the internet, money laundering and so on. You're doing a good job, but it's overwhelming you. Uh, and, and I don't think, as Europol is set up, it's possible. And therefore, um, I think the answer is an FBI. And I'll give you a simple story. When I was in Washington, I spent some time with the FBI there, and they said, oh, right, in Europe, you've now opened the borders. You are where we in America were in the 1930s. I said, why the 1930s? 
They d did you see the movie Bonnie and Clyde, they said? And maybe you remember that one, where, where Bonnie and Clyde robbed banks, and they took the, the money in an old car across the state frontier, and they were very successful because no police could follow them. And the American FBI says, that's where you are in Europe. You've opened the borders. You now need a new agency with the authority to cross the borders and fight the guys on an international scale. And um, with great respect to our, our policemen again, I don't think it's any longer true that um, individual people in different parts of Europe want to be arrested by their own policemen anyway, because you are eligible to work in a British police force uh, and because you have a right as a European citizen to do that. So you could make an arrest in Britain if you were wearing a British uniform. So the British people don't feel that. And I have to say my final point, uh, because I've been on this subject of a European FBI for years, I regularly put this to my constituents and public opinion in Britain anyway says, what a good idea, why aren't you doing it? My God, and it's really the national politicians in London and maybe in Copenhagen and Berlin who are saying, oh no, we're very afraid of this. But the public says, there's a problem, fix it please. And they expect us to do it. Would you like to react to both of you? Bob, do you want to? <laughs> no, no, no. my mind. I think that, first of all, the uh, policy makers, Europol, uh, we sometimes miss an opportunity of not making a good story to the public already now on what the European Police Cooperation, Europol, the Police Cooperation Centres, uh, or other EU instruments have uh, produced, i.e. I don't think the picture is uh, is all bleak. Uh, I think that the uh, we should probably, uh, and I'm probably criticizing myself, we should probably all do a better job at communicating what what more what what is being done now already to um, to address uh, the problems by virtue of uh, EU law, EU agencies, EU money, uh, or EU good spirit of cooperation, if I could put it like that. Then there's also, I don't know exactly what you mean by a European FBI. Um, there's this limit in the Lisbon Treaty, whether we like it or not, that says that Europol cannot have coercive powers. Coercive powers uh, lay at national level. But this should not lead us to conclude that Europol should therefore necessarily be a lame duck. I mean, Europol is not a lame duck, but uh, it's certainly uh, going in the right direction. But I think that there are vast opportunities, and there I agree with Trill Zerting, of simply uh, making the present model work, i.e. better, more update, live information being provided by uh, the member states to Europol, uh, better linkages between the fi findings made by Europol and operations at national level. Um, there's much more that could be done there. And so uh, I do believe that uh, the future reform we have in mind uh, with these ideas of improving the mechanisms of feeding Europol with appropriate information, making sure that the Europol information is followed up, making sure that Europol has access to information coming from the private sector, making sure that Europol has a better access to information coming from the rest of the world, uh, should, uh, in our view, uh, lead to quite good results in the medium term. But the thing I'd like to draw your attention to is that the coercive, I mean, the coercive powers uh, limitation is in the Lisbon Treaty. Can I just add a question? Because it seems to me to be odd that you have lots of informations but there's a lack of avail uh, availability of these informations for, for the Europol. Uh, how come? Why is it so? Can you explain that? Is it because of the policy makers or is it because no, of the no, computing I've system? Or, or, or well, the why? mandate of Europol is already quite wide right now. We talk about that all information con concerning serious crime of a cross-border nature should be supplied to Europol. I think that's the definition, isn't it? 
um, there needs to be better, this is probably not immediately obvious to the policemen on the ground in the member state to understand exactly what this means, how to translate this big legalese concept into an operational deliverable so that he or she knows exactly on a concrete situation, well, what does this mean? What information am I concretely uh, obliged to, to give to Europe? Well, I think that training would play a major role there in making people understand what their obligations would be. Okay, Maybe I can add. Um, it's interesting what you say, and of course, uh, it's also uh, challenging uh, in, in, in a way. <laughs> but I also think that, that this union has to, to grow gradually. And you cannot you know, jump to, uh, to things that might not be um, be proper right now. If you look at what we have changed since the beginning, I recognize the movie because I've seen it so many times, uh, but, but it's actually not completely true here because we have the hot pursuit, you know this. Uh, if, 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 if a Danish police car is chasing one, we can go to Germany to München if we want to, and, and we can keep our weapons and all this. So we have compensated for, for this hot pursuit thing. We have a European arrest warrant. That you can actually extradite people based on a Greek judge, a Danish judge, a Estonian judge, and we will do this. We also have an instrument called the Joint Investigation Team, which gives us a legal framework that five countries can work together and we do not need to exchange one piece of legal paper. We just start telephone tapping in all the countries based on national rules, so everything disappears. Can I come in just on that? On yeah. the joint information team, I hear that there are political disputes. Who's going to pay for this? Uh, this How is... can I spare the time yeah. to send the policeman on a joint team somewhere? And then it goes up to the politicians to fight who's in charge, how are we going to do it? And the bad guys have already way down the road finished. So joint investigation is a nice idea, but because it's involving many different countries to get involved, it doesn't actually work fast enough. No. That's why we need no. an FBI. I, I think it, it works fast enough. Uh, it, it actually does work fast enough. I, I don't even think it's very cumbersome to create it. The, 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 the legal framework is, is rather straightforward. I recognize, however, that there is an, an economic implication, because if you want to fight organized international crime, you cannot do it uh, from London or from Copenhagen. You send a team, two or three officers, maybe to Europol. Europol will assist you. This costs travel expenses, hotels, and whatever. Torsh, will you please... Uh, Sorry. Mike. Sorry. This money, from time to time, we are supported by the European Union. They have a number of ISEC funding programs where you can fund joint investigation teams. I would argue, not enough. But I think that the Commission will address this. They have an inter internal security fund, and I hope they will, because money talks, especially in these days. If you cannot support it, member states simply don't give a... Yeah, they will just continue with their domestic cases, and that's it. So, of course, we need to have some kind of in incentive and I think money talks in, in, in this direction. A, an interesting new challenge will be cybercrime. Because one thing is that you can deal with physical crime, where you have a physical perpetrator who has stolen something in a street, and you capture him here. But if you have a perpetrator, and you do not know where he is, and wh what he steals, and he might steal that in a number of countries, who will have the responsibility here to make the investigation? Who will coordinate that we are not spending immense resources in 17 different countries on the same case, for instance? How do we share this information? And I think this is where we will have the more intellectual challenge of the future police cooperation will be when we establish the cybercrime sensor to actually decode this. Because we have a difference from the US and us. They have one language and one legal framework. We have 23 different languages and 27 different legal frameworks like it or not. This is what we have. So just exchanging information. If I ask my colleagues from Lithuania to exchange information, they will do it in Lithuanian. I'm Danish. I don't understand it. Otherwise, they have to translate it in order for me to capture it. So it's not just so easy to make access via UMF to, to, to the same databases. I have to decode it and translate it. So we have a number of challenges. Not that we cannot 
overcome them, because I think that we should prioritize our work. We shouldn't, you know, uh, deal with every stone that we meet on our road if it's, it's the same size. We have to, to, to actually focus on the right ones, and we can do this. I don't think we are there yet, but I think we are in the right direction. If the speed is right, that might also, you could put a bit more speed on it, but I think we can do a lot still between the member states, coordinated by a coordinating body like us with the access to all the information, subject to we have the information, and, and, and we subject maybe even to that we can ask the member states to do something about it. But you will see this in cybercrime, and I think this will be the first challenge, and what you will do then in the online world, you might copy to the offline world. I don't know. If I could just add also two arguments. I think this argument of the cybercrime center is also very important to illustrate the pressures of the financial crisis and budgetary restraint. Does it make sense that all the European member states have sophisticated capacities to fight a niche type of criminality like cybercrime rather than put all those resources in a central body like Europol? We think that th there's, a, there's a very strong potential of specialization uh, in having certain niche fight against crime areas being better developed at European level so as to avoid a, a, du a duplication, triplication or quadruplication of capacities at national level. And another good example of how things are advancing in Europe, the member states are also busy putting in place the prune decisions which would allow them, and allow them already now, m member states are legally now obliged to have systems that allow them to check the DNA, fingerprint, and vehicle registration databases of each other to verify if there is information on a concrete fingerprint, DNA, or a vehicle registration uh, data. There are many things happening and of, uh, of quite some importance. Do we have a breaking news here, Mr. Almeida? <laughs> the Cybercrime Center, could you enlighten us on the communication that would be the forthcoming communication from the Commission there? When would it be announced? I won't. I, I I'm not yet in a position. To, I mean, it's going to be soon, but I can't. I'm not the one responsible for that one. I'm, I'm not sure exactly. If Sorry, didn't mean no to be rude. Um, yes, my name is uh, Stella Veliki. I am. Um, I have studied physics and informatics, and uh, I am an uh, European citizen. And I'm coming here because I have a very a question from many time, a uh, long time ago. Uh, my question is, uh, how you work in the terrorist um, uh, problems? Uh, what I like to see is that if the terrorists they can uh, work very uh, free in the Schengen space, all the terrorists who have done attacks there was in Schengen space. Um, what you don't impose, uh, 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 they, they cannot go free in the Schengen space. What they don't be arrested in two weeks, give extradited to the to the other country. I don't see that you, with your database and with your uh, Interpol information, um, another country information, we can do it this uh, very, very uh, uh, quick. I see. Uh, I see this only with the FBI agency. Uh, then can do it. If, if they go to arrest in the country, the the problem of the of, of the language is not a problem. I think English, French is not a problem. Huh? To have a to have a, a website in English and you can choose the language. I, I mean, it's not a problem. Huh? I think it's 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 a difficult question in one way. Uh, but let me instead tell you about what we will write in our terrorist situation report for 2011. And that is actually that the number of attacks and threats in EU is dropping. And that's a good thing. Um, 
And this is the second year in a row that we see this. And this is, I think, not thanks to Europol, even though we are active in the counter-terrorist fields, but it's actually thanks to the intelligence services in the member states, who together with uh, their colleagues have done an excellent job. And I'm sure that if there has been any increase or pro problems in that area, it would have been elevated if there was a real need. And I don't think that, that, that terrorism is one of the triggers for, for, for raising the bar from an FBI. So I think we are, I have to knock on wood, of course, because we don't know what will happen tomorrow. But I think that we are on relatively safe grounds. It does mean that, that there couldn't be other measures to be introduced, but right now I don't think that, that this will trigger it. And if so, there had been a need, we would have heard it from MI5, MI6, Bundesnachrichtensteins, the SEPA and the other ones, and we haven't. I could also add that I think in the follow-up of the London bomb attacks of 2005, the European arrest warrant was quite instrumental in bringing some of the criminals uh, to prosecution. So that was, I mean, all these instruments that we've, the trolls and I have been talking about are as good to fight terrorism as any other form of crime. Uh, Alvo. Mr. Alvaro. Thank you very much. Um, one issue, just because it's been mentioned, and Mr. Almeida mentioned the cybercrime centers, uh, or the cybercrime center, um, we, we do know for, for a little while now that there are these ideas. Um, and of course, you probably cannot elaborate that way. But among the colleague, colleagues who have been working on cybercrime issues or at the current report on the protection of critical information structures, we had discussions about these plans the commission are supposed to put forward. And uh, there has been sort of an unofficial consensus that it would be interesting uh, to supply Europol with the necessary budgetary means to be able to fulfill this task because it doesn't really make sense if you want to have a coordinated approach against cybercrime. If we, besides ENISA, would have Europol, then a cybercrime center, then the NATO Sec Cybersecurity Center in Tallinn, which of course is not an institutional body, but which we should cooperate more closely with. So they are actually, and, and it would be interesting just to hear maybe if the commission can already say what they would consider from this idea or how they would think that and how Europol would perceive that um, idea, just in a nutshell, again, instead of having something separate, it would be integrated into Europol uh, with the necessary budgetary means to enforce uh, the implementation and to make it workable, because I think it's, again, it doesn't make sense to have too many centers which have to coordinate among each other but have concentrated knowledge at one place. Please. Well, I. Uh, I'll pass on your plea to my colleagues uh, and the top people uh, as far as the Cybercrime Center is concerned. I cannot add more than that. Um, as you know, uh, there are, we're also facing a situation of uh, budgetary and financial uh, restraint in the EU that make uh, significant inroads difficult, but the matter is still to be decided uh, by the Commission this year. But again, as I said, I, I cannot do more than pass on uh, your plea uh, for uh, further support and further financial reinforcement of Europol to, uh, to have a more uh, beefed up capacity to fight cybercrime. Thank you. I agree fully, Mr. Alvaro, um, with your views. I think um, now I think that we have, first of all, to, to wait for the Commissioner. I think that she would very much like to, to break this news when, when the time is right. Uh, then we will have to look at what is the task and responsibilities. I agree with you. We have to coordinate this very, very closely with ENISA, uh, with the, uh, Estonia, with uh, CEPOL, with Eurojust, and with our partners also in FBI and uh, all over the world. And you cannot feed the dog with its own tail. So. Uh, if you want to do this in a realistic way, and if you also want to have a credible answer at a European level, it will cost you money, austerity or no austerity. This is just a professional indication. And then I will skip it because I'm a, 
I'm an agency employee and should probably not uh, go further here, but I think that it was as, as precise as I could be, Mr. Alvum. Um, my name is Michael Schumiller. I'm a researcher at um, Brussels School of International Studies, and I would like to um, address a question to uh, you, Mr. Erting. Um, you raised the issue that it's um, very important to, to gain more information about what will happen. Um, do you see any data protection or more generally fundamental rights uh, protection issues regarding this aim? Thanks. It's a, it's a very good and a justified question because this is always a balance that law enforcement have to take. Um, I, I, I'm also a citizen in the European Union and in Denmark, and I don't want you know a big brother society that everybody knows everything about me. And I think this is also one of the problems that we see by the increased use of the social media and in the internet and all the other areas. However, there is a legitimate risk. No, a legitimate let's say, request from the law enforcement authorities in order to keep the public safe that they also need to store information. And I think that there is also an understanding. Now you have to find the balance how much is needed. And I can assure you, uh, also told Mr. Mulder, that I, I come from Denmark. I don't think this is a banana republic in data protection. But the data protection regime I have in the EU, in Europe, is much, much stricter than the one that I used to have in my Danish police system. So I think that there are built-in guarantees for purpose limitation, for scope, and for use, and for misuse. For instance, in this week where I'm here, we have the JSB, the Joint Supervisory Body, with 12 people all over our databases. Why did you ask for this? Why did you put this in? Whatever, justify this. Every, every three months, we have this. And I think this is good, because this gives us the security that there is light on this. But you also have to recognize that if we should have any possibility to make sure that organized crime will not take over this union, which it will if we will not be able to pinpoint the right ones, then we will always arrest the most stupid. This is all the people in the jails are the most stupid idiots. But the real ones behind it that we want to take out of circulation, the organized criminal top, the kingpins, they are not walking out in the street with two kilos of cocaine. They are in a nice villa in Marseille or in Cannes. And these are the ones that we need to, to pinpoint. And in doing so, we need to store intelligence. And this is what we do. And then I hope that the DPO notifications and the JSB report will actually make you happy with the level. But I think we have a right balance. I don't think that we need more data protection. I think we have the right balance. Thank you. May I just react shortly to that? Um, um, thanks for the for the answer, Mr. Erting. Um, if I if I'm not mistaken, right now it's it's the case with the Europol decision that uh, on the basis of factual indications and reasonable grounds, this information uh, information can be gathered um, if if there is a suspicion that a person will commit actually a crime in the future. Do you see this is a formulation which? Um, sufficiently protects the data protection issues, maybe? The good thing about this is that this is done on a national responsibility. We do not collect this information. We are given this information by the Danish police, the Portuguese police, or the German police based on their assessment. So first of all, there's a data protection at the source level, at the police. Then they give it to us. Then we also assess is there a justified need for this information? Do we need to, st to, to, to store them? And all the other things. So you have two levels of justification, which I think is sufficient. Personally, I think it's sufficient. And so far, also the data protection community has thought that this was sufficient. And, and I think that you have to, to realize that, that we, we, we need the development that we see now with the austerity also gives the indication of police budget cuts, 16% in some uh, countries. You also see that a lot of people will be without work, without the means 
to actually live, and they also want to buy things. They will lower their parades to buy stolen goods and other things. There will also maybe be the indication of increased corruption. In order to mitigate this, we need also to have information stored about this so that we can address the best possible targets with the least economic you know, influence from the police with the best effect. And to do so, the trick is intelligence-led policing. This is not guessing. This is based on an assumption which is assessed by the police in the member states and by us. But by compiling this information, we suddenly see that an, a big, big organization is active in a number of countries where they, in some countries, are having their proceeds of crime. And in other countries, they are legitimate companies for white washing their money, and in other countries, the expendables, the one that we always catch, the careers, the guys on the border that, that takes the heat, 10 years in prison, and the other one, they don't care. It's just like another you know, truck with, uh, with beer that is turned over on the highway. They'll just send another truck. So we need, in order to catch these guys, to have these instruments. And the balance, I think, is, 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 is at this time right. But first of all, thank you very much, Paul Schotting and Mr. Nunes de la Almeida. I think we should give our two speakers a hand for their contribution. And let's continue now with a panel between academic expert Dr. Christian Kaunet, who's on my right side here, senior lecturer with the University of Salford and Marie Curie, fellow at the European University Institute Florence, and Mr. Hugo Brady. Mr. Brady, where are you? He will be there in a second. Oh yeah, he, ha he has a deadline uh, of something. So, so uh, maybe we should just then take a break until yeah. he is uh, there. That, uh, or should we just, uh, would you like to start uh, now? We, we, can, uh, we can do that. Okay, I give you the floor immediately, Mr. Kalnett. Right. Uh, just double check whether the microphone works. Yes, it does. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's a great honor to be here, so I'm very happy to be able to have the opportunity to speak to you today. My work has been on EU distant home affairs for quite a number of years, and so I'll be trying to set it in the context of what I've previously written and, and, and the work that I've done in justice and home affairs. I think one of the things that is important, I think, if we want to assess in, in how far um, we want to protect Schengen, in, in how far we might need a European FBI in order to protect Schengen and in order to maybe also further Schengen as a system, it's kind of important to also see how far we've already come. And I think uh, the area of justice and home affairs in general has certainly been one of high dynamism. I certainly remember as a as a young PhD student a number of years ago, um, when we used to go to academic conferences and we wanted to speak about EU justice and home affairs, at the time I used to be maybe one of one or two people at the entire conference who wanted to discuss these issues. Now the last couple of years we've had a number of conferences both in Salford and uh, in Florence. And nowadays we can easily have 60, 70 academics who all want to discuss these issues. So I think this is a very much a growth of, of the area and, and, and a growth of academic research on the topic. So I'm, I'm very, very pleased about that. I think we've come quite a long way in that um, from what used to be a very, very intergovernmental affair uh, to the extent that it wasn't even part of the European Union as a political corporation, of course, uh, Schengen and, and, and later then Prüm initially being outside the framework of the European Union, um, later then introduced Schengen certainly uh, with the Amsterdam Treaty um, into the framework of the European Union. We've had a number of high points in the area. Uh, firstly, of course, the, uh, the Tampere Council summit that kind of set the scene and really uh, pushed the area very significantly, and of course, uh, more recently, 
the Lisbon Treaty and, of course, the Stockholm Programme that I think sets the agenda. Um, that is quite ambitious, and I think um, we will get quite far with it, although, um, as I will say uh, in a few moments as well, there are, there are a number of issues that are not um, fully addressed yet, as it were. I don't want to dwell too long on, on the challenges because a lot of the previous speakers have already done that. I mean, um, you know uh, that uh, we have significant challenges in the European Union, um, notably ranging from issue areas such as cross-border crime, um, other types of security threats, of course, uh, the importance of terrorism, even though, as, as it's just been pointed out, um, it is a possibly decreasing phenomenon. Um, we have very significant migration flows. We saw, certainly saw that in the aftermath of the Arab Spring, that this created a very big um, political dynamic in a number of member states. I remember um, uh, just occasionally reading the Spiegel on the internet, and I remember reading an article that the first Tunisian migrant was spotted in Germany at the time. Um, it was an article about one migrant, as, uh, as I remember. Um, so I think that there are certainly a number of, you know, worries that partially are legitimate, partially are also exaggerations that, that are also in order to sell uh, newspapers. Um, there are, of course, uh, important challenges with regards to policing. And I think um, it is also important, especially in the aftermath of the Arab Spring, to point out that there are significant challenges also in terms of, well, how do we deal with refugees that are fleeing um, persecution under horrendous regimes such as the one in Libya, for instance? Um, how, do we, how do we deal with them? Um, I'm not entirely convinced that we've dealt with them in the best way possible uh, in the immediate aftermath, but um, certainly there are issues to address. Now, in 2010, I published a book where I looked at the area of justice and home affairs, and I, and I wrote about this increasing um, supranational governance in the area. I mean, I, it was very much in response to a number of um, scholars who had written about you know, the intergovernmental character of justice and home affairs that was very strongly, of course, in vogue um, in the 1990s. But I think there's an increasing, real, increasing realization um, in, in practice, I'm sure, but also in academic, um, amongst academic scholars, that, that we are putting in a system that is starting to resemble increasingly uh, a supranational system of governance, or, albeit uh, an incomplete system of supranational go governance. Uh, certainly, um, various, uh, for a number of years, a number of academics have argued for an increased role of the European Parliament in the area, and I think um, this is certainly one of the big uh, changes over the last couple of years, that the European Parliament um, is now able to really take its role as a full um, democratic uh, legislator, and I think that is a, a big, big step forward, what we can do in this area, because it provides the kind of legitimacy that maybe some of the instruments were previously lacking. Um, we certainly have, in terms of the institutional system, we have very important developments in that um, the, the role of the European Commission has been significantly strengthened. I mean, I remember um, as a young PhD student conducting a research interview with the late Sir Adrian Fortescue, and he was um, telling me at the time about how, you know, it was difficult at the beginning to, for the Commission to kind of carve out a role in the area, being um, <coughs> suspiciously regarded by the member states, both for taking, um, obviously, competences away, but also for not having the kind of expertise that they thought was necessary. I certainly think that we've come a long way <laughs> in that regard. Um, we also have a very significant increase in terms of the powers of the European Court of Justice, and I think that is very important to point out, because, of course, especially when we're dealing with areas such as, you know, um, freedom, security, and justice, um, we do need a pan-European arbiter of what exactly justice means, of what exactly security means, and I think we now not completely because, of course, there are transition periods, but we are moving towards a system where we'll have that. 
um, we certainly have a, a kind of transition phase where we have a kind of an incomplete contracting stage where you know the treaties are there but not fully applied yet in all respects but of course um, the European Court of Justice uh, will play an increasing role which is also part of a broader trend that we can see in the area the uh, an increasing judicialization of justice and home affairs we can certainly notice that trend very strongly uh, in the area of EU asylum policy a trend that has you know, in academic circles, was written about quite a lot in the 1980s and 1990s about the national level, where um, a lot of courts were increasingly becoming important in terms of shaping policy by way of um, having verdicts about a number of cases. And I think we are now seeing this development also at the European level, where we see uh, two twin developments, an increasing role of uh, legal texts, such as, of course, uh, the role of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, um, in the asylum area, Article 18 and 19 need to be pointed out. Of course, an increasing role via the enshrining and EU treaties of the Geneva Convention, making it a much, much stronger tool than what maybe had been possible before when it was regarded primarily as an instrument of international law. We see a massive increase in the role of courts. We see an increase uh, in the role of the European Court of Justice, but not to be neglected, the European Court of Human Rights and the possible accession of the European Union to the European Court of Human Rights, which I think would also strengthen um, fundamental rights in the European Union very significantly. So I think, um, despite problems that I'm sure we can see as well, we also see an increasing raising uh, in standards um, right across different policy areas. However, I think it is also important to point out that if we do look at the entire area of just and home affairs, that to a certain extent it is an unequal development, that we don't necessarily see the same advances in integration in all parts of the area. We see a certain, um, we had seen strong advances um, in the area of EU counterterrorism, for instance, we just recently organized a special issue reflecting on the first 10 years, the real 10 years of EU counterterrorism policy. And I think we certainly, a number of academics, we came up um, that we shared a lot of the conclusions of Mr. Gilles de Kerkhove when he um, uh, anal outlined uh, what we've achieved in, in that respect. And I do think we have achieved a lot in that respect. Um, even though there, there are a number of issues that still need to be improved. But it is certainly one of the areas that has been advanced quite significantly. Um, the European arrest warrant, of course, has, has been pointed out that was uh, very important uh, in 2005 after uh, the London bombing. Um, we also have a relatively, I mean, relatively compared, obviously, it's not enough compared to what we might want to achieve, but relatively strong EU asylum policy. And here, of course, um, uh, we are working towards having stronger standards, indeed. But there are a number of challenges at the same time. And um, uh, my colleague and I, who's also in the room, we've been conducting a number of research interviews in terms of a project that we're conducting at the moment, a comparative assessment of justice and home affairs agencies. And one of the challenges um, when we discuss this issue is certainly um, the variable geometry that we have in this area, the kind of different legal mechanisms. Um, certainly one of the countries that I come from, the United Kingdom, is in a very peculiar position in a lot of these areas. Um, Ireland um, is, an, and so is Denmark. And that and doesn't always make it easy. And it will make it increasingly difficult, not only because um, we have an increasing opt-out, opt-in system where um, uh, the United Kingdom that used to opt into quite, well, almost everything is now starting to opt into less after the change of government. Um, we also have different interpretations of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, how they might apply to those opt-outs. So that will raise standards, uh, that will raise, um, will increase the challenges that we have in the area. And I think, um, again, the European Court of Justice, I'm sure, will come in at some point to, to clarify some of these issues. We have an increasing trend in the area, and just the fact that we are conducting this research project on, on justice and home affairs agencies. Um, we 
have an increasing agencification of the area, which means we have an increasing delegation of quite significant functions to agencies, uh, Europol obviously being one of the most uh, established and, and, and oldest of the agencies, but we have a, a vast array of different agencies that deal with uh, just in home affairs issues at, at, at one point or another. Um, I guess uh, in a narrow interpretation you can talk about at least about nine agencies. If in a slightly broader interpretation you might talk about 14 agencies. So um, you certainly have a, a, a trend in delegating a number of functions. Now that um, provides a number of opportunities, but it also provides a number of challenges. Some of the opportunities uh, and challenges <laughs> at the same time is, of course, uh, policy coordination. How do you ensure that policy is well coordinated across uh, such a range of different agencies that maybe sometime, um, sometimes uh, kind of tread on each other's territory a little bit? I mean, um, Europol and CEPOL could be pointed out, but, but there, there are other instances um, uh, something that you might expect less could be something such as Frontex and Europol that might also be interested in similar informations at times and uh, similar um, similar territory. So uh, policy coordination in that respect is important. Now we have some of the tools in terms of greater interagency coordination, but it remains a challenge whether this can be fully realized. Um, we also have a challenge in terms of legitimacy. Um, in the academic literature in general, agencies um, are seen as potentially providing greater legitimacy to a particular policy area, but it can also raise challenges depending on how the precise functions are delegated, the control mechanisms that are in place, um, and of course here the role of the European Parliament is, is absolutely crucial to make sure that, that this is fulfilled, and in order to overcome also democratic challenges, to make sure that uh, all the decisions are always uh, according to the highest standards. Um, we also um, have challenges in terms of cost efficiency. One of the things that we discussed with some of our interviewees were certainly um, uh, coordination costs when you um, when you delegate functions to agencies, that suddenly there's other functions that are now necessary in order to coordinate work that previously might not have been necessary. So you, there's a question in terms of costs, um, whether it's always the most cost-effective way of organizing the work. In some instances it might be, in other instances it might not be. So, And then finally, of course, in terms of providing uh, kind of outlook for a more European public in terms of, well, does the European public actually realize the amount of uh, functions that are already delegated at, at that point? In the area, we also have an, another trend in terms of the importance of new modes of governance. We have a variety of different tools. Now, we've kind of made the area similar to previously the, the so-called community method, and, and there are certain elements that, that remind us of the community methods, but we also have uh, other tools that are not so much in line with the community method, and that provides uh, certain challenges in terms of, well, how is that going to work? I'm, I'm sure there can be ways uh, found around that, but it could also mean in terms of um, that potentially spilling over into some of the other areas that were previously already um, uh, in the so-called first pillar. So there is a number of opportunities and challenges that we can, that we can see. Now, if we want to sig significantly move, I think, towards a European FBI that was previously pointed out, I don't think in principle it's a bad idea. I think in principle moving towards a stronger, um, more integrated um, a system of governance in terms of fighting crime, in terms of fighting terrorism, in terms of, you know, border security, but also in terms of, you know, protecting uh, citizens' uh, freedoms and rights. I think um, that that may be one of the options to look at. But of course, in order to achieve that, there's a number of things that need to come with it. Um, you can't just create a European FBI in the absence of some of the other things that you would also need to create alongside with it. At the moment, we are creating um, uh, 
certain form of transnational democracy, a, a supranational governance system in the EU. But of course, one of the things where we still need to work hard is in terms of constructing a European political community, because um, in order to make a fully functioning democratic and legitimate system of that nature, such as a European FBI um, would be, you would certainly need to potentially go one or two steps further in terms of creating such a European um, political community. We are certainly somewhere when we talk about um, the role of the European Parliament and the increased role of the European Parliament, I think you could also go further in terms of legitimizing the European Commission, in terms of um, bringing in uh, some of the overlaps between different institutions in line, but you would also need to go much further in terms of creating a European political community in terms of the European media. I mean, a lot of the times, even though some of the events that, um, that occur, um, they're still reported very much <coughs> along national lines. We might very much see a big uh, organized crime case that is being solved in one or two countries and yet we don't always see that in terms of you know being European news very often it is still perceived as a national news our wonderful national police cracked this um, even though they might have just cracked this as part of the case but we certainly need to go much further in terms of creating a sort of European awareness in terms of um, creating a European political discourse, a European political debate with the citizens in terms of outlining, of course, the challenges, in terms of outlining the achievements. Um, so in that sense, I would argue that in order to save Schengen and in order to sh save and, and further the functions of the Schengen system, in order to create a kind of a European FBI, it doesn't have to be exactly along the lines of the FBI because it's been rightly pointed out before. In some respects, I think the EU might be even already more integrated than uh, the United States. In other respects, it's much less integrated, of course. Um, you, you do need to build a European political community and, and go much, much further. Those two things need to go hand in hand. Um, and I think I don't know how much time I've left, but I think I'll probably leave it here and leave everything else for, for questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cowanet. And I give directly the floor to Mr. Hugo Brady from the Think Tank Centre of European Reform. Please. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation to this afternoon's seminar. It's a great honour to be here, and uh, I think that this couldn't be a more timely subject, and I congratulate you both on trying to get a serious debate going about this issue, because it's a very, very political issue, it's a very sensitive issue. It's an issue on which almost everything you say is wrong, and that's why for about a year I struggled to write this, this pamphlet uh, called Saving Schengen, and I'll explain to you in a second why I think Schengen sort of needs to be saved. Uh, and uh, when it came out, I was, I was shortly afterwards called the Dan Brown of Justice and Home Affairs Policy, uh, which is not a compliment. That's the chap who wrote the, uh, the Da Vinci Code, because some people found it a bit alarmist. Uh, but in fact, I don't think the Schengen area is going to fall apart. In fact, I think that's almost impossible. What I do think is that we're all here today because of the Franco-Italian issue last year, where for the first time public confidence in the Schengen area was, was challenged. And Schengen and borders immigrants, crime, all that sort of stuff is largely very political. We don't actually have a lot of strong facts about, for example, how much extra criminality there is in the EU because we have free movement and passport free travel. We do not have any real evidence that we can take in a sheet of paper and say, the EU has made you a little less safer. We don't really have that. What All that matters is voter perceptions. All that matters is, is how the political debate goes, the media debate goes, about whether or not the EU is a part of the solution or part of the problem on immigration and security matters. And now, generally speaking, Schengen has been a vastly good thing. It's introduced a freedom to travel around Europe not seen since the outbreak of the First World War. Isn't that fantastic? I think that's absolutely amazing. Um, I don't think that in, in any scenario, almost any scenario, the Schengen area would fall apart uh, because of our recent troubles. But they have pinpointed some vulnerabilities in the system in the sense that it, the Schengen and the Euro crisis have some analogies. You shouldn't get too caught up in them because, you know, if the, the Euro can't reintroduce monetary policy for a day or two and when the problem has all gone away, 
uh, reintroduce the ECB again. If the euro falls apart, it really will fall apart and uh, be very, very, very difficult to restore, uh, almost impossible. But the Schengen area can have crises. It can have political crises. The only thing I would argue is that they're eminently avoidable. And the last thing I would ever want to see is a repeat of the Franco Italian incident last year, because what happened there was it was a dispute over a very small number of migrants, about 200, at the, uh, uh, at the border near the town of Ventimiglia, which is, uh, is the last town on the border before France. Uh, it really wasn't a big deal at all. Uh, the, uh, the, the French reintroduced border controls. The Italians objected. They had a summit. A month later, they, all, they made friends again. And uh, something, but experts like myself realised that something very, very peculiar had happened. They'd signed up to this agreement to review the, the rules of the Schengen area. And why did they do that? Well, because, my friends, although Britain might have its issues, it is not the main problem in the Schengen area. Uh, there are some countries that like the Schengen area more than mo others, and one of them that doesn't is France. And you'll have already seen this in France's battles with Madame Reding and so on. The French have a very strong sense of state security. When they joined the Schengen area uh, in the 90s, they were one of the last countries to lift border controls with other member states. You have to know your history in order to be able to understand this conflict. Uh, so they've never really liked Schengen. In fact, the current commissioner for the internal market, uh, who was quite important in this issue at the time, said, we're only in favour of a Schengen that works. We don't care about your treaties. We don't care about your supposed powers. The minute the Schengen area does not work for our citizens, we would put up border controls and we don't care. So that's the sort of, you're dealing with interior ministries here. Interior ministries are not foreign ministries. They're not economics ministries. They're the, they're the wildest element of the, of the sort of nation state system. They've never really been civilized by the EU. Uh, they, they don't really even consider that the EU really has a lot to tell them about security. If I can leave you with one small message here today, I would like to, to say that until, if I can ask the question, how many people in this room, and indeed in this building, are involved in somehow helping the member states to protect European borders and improve the, si the security of European citizens, mitigating some of the, the bad effects of free movement, which is largely hugely beneficial, we won't really be doing our job at a European level to help shore up the Schengen system. Because as long as it's just the member states' job, they will just say, guys, look, you're not very serious. You, want, you live in a utopian world where you know, all undocumented immigrants have rights and where we don't really have a right to defend our borders, etc. Until we can have a more constructive conversation with interior ministries. Difficult, I know, believe you me, because I have to go around and interview them. And they're not talkative people. Um, then we won't really get where we need to go. So in my view, the parliament definitely needs to step in here and come up with some ideas about how Yes, indeed, as, as we have put down in today's agenda, how we can mitigate some of the bad effects of free movement, and I'll go into how we might do that, uh, while preserving it. You know, there's, there's something called in economics the tragedy of commons, and that is when it's everyone's, everyone can use something, but it's no one's job to look after it. That is a sort of eminent tragedy also in the euro crisis, when German and Greek debt was, the same, was rated the same by the international markets. Everyone thought that would go on forever. That is a blissful state of innocence, but it doesn't last. And uh, if I could go into the sort of the, the analogies for the Schengen area, is that our, unfortunately, poor Greece is also the main problem in the Schengen area today. And this paper I've written, which was very kindly copied, and I have a few copies here, but only a few, uh, basically argues that we can have a new crisis next year, if certain, or this year, if certain conditions happen. Uh, the first is that Greece has never really been considered a member of the, of the Schengen area. Uh, it, when it joined in 2000, basically Greece maintained its border with Turkey with its army. Now this is illegal under Schengen rules, so when it joined Schengen, it was no longer allowed to do that. And it duly, dutifully pulled its army back from the Turkish border. The problem is, is that the Turkish border has become the greatest illegal uh, point of entry for illegal entrance into the Schengen area. Again, it doesn't really matter about the facts, what matters is the perception, but this is actually true. So, and Greece basically probably shouldn't have ever joined the Schengen area because it didn't really pass its Schengen evaluations. And Schengen evaluations are how we determine the health of a country's border controls. And the Schengen evaluations are carried out by other member states. And it's sort of like, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to intrude on you if you don't intrude on me. It's a very, if you remember, Mario Monti wrote a piece about the Eurozone crisis in the FT where he said, Europe's problem is that it's too polite and too deferential. Well, we definitely have this issue in the, in the Schengen area, where you just don't, you don't tell a, uh, another country that you have 
you have terrible borders, you have to change everything. And even if they do have terrible borders and don't pass their evaluations, there's no way to kick them out of the Schengen area or suspend them from the Schengen area. Because no different than you or I, these countries, border services, etc., they don't do anything unless they have to. They don't do anything unless they have to. Never. So uh, why, is that, why is this such a problem? Well, it hasn't been a problem for 10 years because Greece is the only continental Schengen country not joined to the rest by land. Okay? So we have a free movement area. We have an area where you're not allowed to set up border controls or uh, you can only set up temporary border controls under very strict con uh, conditions. Uh, but if you have to pass through a port or an airport, well, that keeps countries in, the, let's say, the west of Europe very calm because they know that they can control the flow of people coming through from Greece. The, uh, there are security checks, people have to show identity documents. You well know yourself that most people can't get on an aeroplane these days without showing a passport, no matter where they are. So member states feel they have a system of control. And this is where Schengen enlargement comes in to Romania and Bulgaria, because once Bulgaria and Romania join, this will no longer be the case. Greece will suddenly be joined to Bulgaria, which also has a border with Turkey, this will largely uh, exacerbate the current problems in Greece, and we have some very real problems in Greece. There are there's been an ongoing attempt to reform Greece's immigration and asylum system, but it just hasn't been going as fast as we would like and hasn't achieved the results we would like. In fact, one, one fact that particularly concerned me was that Greece, we've made 200 million at least available to Greece to pull down, to create a new asylum system and to improve its border guards and so on, but Greece hasn't been able to absorb the money. So the only tool we have at EU level to improve things in Greece, they're not, they don't have the domestic capacity to actually get things going. And if we can't fix Greece, then I'm afraid we can't really go ahead with Schengen enlargement by land. I don't mind about airport supports. That's, that's, we can manage that. But the land situation creates a new political dynamic in the Schengen area, which is potentially extremely dangerous. And this is why I, I, I wrote this paper, because I was so alarmed by the Franco-Italian affair. I thought to myself, well, what will happen when Schengen enlargement happens, and the problems in Greece, which won't go away anytime soon, are still as they are. Uh, one solution I came up with is that there is a real need to work far more closely with the Turks on border control. That will not be easy, given the fact that the one thing that the Turks want in return is visa liberalisation, and no country wants to, or very few countries in Europe, has an appetite for abolishing visas with, uh, with the Turkish citizens. I argued, as you will see in, I think it was chapter seven of my paper, I said that number one, it's already happening by the back door in some cases. The European Court of Justice is, is relying on an, an old trade agreement between Turkey and the EU to knock down visa requirements between Turkey and several European countries, including Britain, actually. Uh, it's not just a Schengen thing. So what that is to say is that the, the, the carrot of visa liberalisation is becoming less and less useful to us. So we're going to have to pick a very good time to use it. Uh, what can the Turks give us in return? Well, there's a readmission agreement on, uh, on the repatriation of illegal entrants. Uh, it, it not only covers the repatriation of those who cross into Turkey illegally, but it covers those who cross into any European country illegally from anywhere else uh, in Turkey. So anyone who uses Turkey as a transit, what we call a transit country, Turkey will agree to take the, these uh, illegal entrants back and presumably send them back to where they came from. So this is an agreement that really the European Commission, for example, has been relying as, on this as the major deliverable to help member states manage illegal immigration. It really is about immigration so much as, not so much as security. I'm, I'm not too sure that a European FBI would really help us address any of these questions. Uh, but what, what is for sure absolutely necessary is that you cannot have a free movement and area and passport-free zone without a functioning security policy, without a functioning European security policy. And that has many, many elements. Uh, it's not an, it's not an asy asylum policy is another area where I actually don't see much chance for reform, which is a pity. Uh, but on the immigration side of things, tensions within the Schengen area would be significantly reduced if we had a functioning migration policy. Now, what would be a very interesting exercise, not for today but for another time, is to show that, well, like the Eurozone, we, uh, we've, we've abolished, member states have given up largely their right to maintain their own borders, the same way they gave up control over monetary policy. But immigration policy, stroke economic policy, has remained national. So we don't have any rules of the game. Uh, unfortunately, the, the Commission's proposals currently tabled to reform the Schengen area don't really, wouldn't really totally address the Franco-Italian problem we had last year. Because what triggered that? Well, it was because the then Interior Minister, uh, Roberto Moroni, he said, look, these guys are from Tunisia. They are French-speaking. France has the responsibility for them. So uh, we don't want them in Italy. So what I will do is I will give them residency permits. 
And when they were given the residency permits, I think that they are going to go to the country that speaks the same language as they do. And uh, there were no rules of the game. There were no, if I may say, without being a chauvinist on International Women's Day, there were no gentlemen's rules, if you know what I mean. There was no, you know, you may not issue temporary uh, residence permits to people you know are not going to be residents, to people you know that are immediately going to go to join their relatives in France. Um, so we don't have rules of the game. We don't have a common legal migration policy. Now, that's very, very, very difficult. I am in no illusions that that would be difficult. But we need some basic sort of principles. You're not going to issue uh, residency permits to get people to leave your country and go to another one. When you, uh, when you regulate the status of illegal immigrants, you're not going to do it all in one go. So Spain in 2005 uh, regularised the status of 650,000 uh, illegal immigrants. Okay, I actually think regularisations are a good thing. Uh, but they did it all in one go, and the, this enraged the other uh, uh, members of the Schengen area, because once you do that, you've just added 650,000 people to the population of the EU. Uh, you've also given them the right to travel around freely. So the fact that you take these decisions without consulting anybody else is not very gentlemanly, so to speak. Um, so because I want to leave a lot of time for discussion and so on, and I, it's very difficult to talk about these issues, and I am the last speaker, I'm going to... I'm going to cease my comments here, but I'm going to uh, finish just by summating that the main thing here is not the technical, the technocratic measures, which are of course very important and which great strides have been made. Great strides have been made towards a European security policy, but we're not, making, we're, not, we're not getting there fast enough. All of the EU's attempts to sort of put that security buffer into the uh, free movement and the Schengen area, because it's basically the same thing, uh, haven't been going very well. They have something called Project Harmony, for example, which is to get trying to get the police to do joined up intelligence, agree on which, which are the security problems in the Schengen area, and then, uh, largely through money supplied from the European Union, which I think is a very good thing, sort of focus on them together. And that's very difficult. It's just as much an issue for police as it is for, for, for civil servants. Um, so the security policy, uh, progress towards a real security policy is very slow so far, but it has to start delivering and the member states have to believe in it. Uh, systems like the Schengen Information System, the member states have been waiting five years, uh, and the budget, uh, budget of which is now five times overdue for something called the Schengen Information System 2. And this was a critical failing of the EU's credibility here. Because the one thing that's not controversial, that has nothing to do with sovereignty, is that we would provide you with big picture European IT systems and they will increase and enhance your security. They're also something for politicians to point to, to voters. Unfortunately, we, although we've had some successes with things like the visa information system, the security stuff has not been as successful, and we have to admit that, and we have to make rapid progress to it. So finally, all I'd say is that sometimes you have to take tough decisions to keep the things you love. And in my view, we have to delay Schengen enlargement until 2014 by land, uh, we have to fix the problems in Greece as quickly as possible, and we have to find a credible way of doing so under a credible timeline. I have various ideas in this for doing that. Uh, we have to take a serious look at European asylum policy because there's a need for a new political bargain there, but I know it's very, very difficult. Uh, we have to reform the Schengen rules so we can deal with non-compliers. And we have to insert uh, some rules on corruption, because corruption at the border is a real, real problem, real, real issue. And we have to find a new deal with Turkey on migration and security. As hard as it will be, we have to navigate through those very, very difficult diplomatic waters because the future of the entire Schengen area relies on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have had uh, two quite uh, political interventions here, very interesting political interventions. Uh, and before opening uh, for questions, I would actually like uh, Mr. Charles Erteng to comment on that. Uh, from the real world's perspective in Europol. Thank you, Jens, uh, for the floor. <clears throat> Two very interesting, I would say, uh, speeches, both of them. And I, um, and especially the, the last one was a bit more uh, provocative than the first one. It, it doesn't mean that the first one had not the quality because I actually listened very carefully to both of them and I learned a lot. I think if you talk about Schengen, um, you're facing two problems, to, to, to keep the ones out that we don't want in, but also inside the system, which is a different matter. When you're in, then you flow around, and, uh, and there needs to be some kind of compensation also here, because all evil to the EU, uh, EU doesn't come from necessarily outside, but it actually also comes from inside. And uh, there we need compensation, and that was why also I mentioned that this enhanced use of the European information system 
uh, should be added to the Schengen system because we need something for the internal security. Uh, I tend to agree in a lot of uh, what you actually summarized, I must say. Um, you are also in the position who can say things like this. I'm in a more delicate position than you are. But, um, but I would also agree that there is a need for a, a CIS too. And, um, and, and, and this is also what, what a bit we are waiting for in the law enforcement community, basically, also to add on our uh, add-ons into this system. So I, I think there's a lot of food for thoughts here. There's a lot also for the politicians and for the commission and also for the law enforcement. Uh, I'm slightly more optimistic maybe than you are, Brady. I, I, I noted that, that, that you said that you believe that the Schengen will not break. I have the same belief. I think we're actually on track. I don't think that, that, that we are just you know, sitting on our hands and doing nothing. I think there is a lot of good things going on out there. And uh, I also think we should acknowledge this and just always point at, at, at the bad things or, or, or one or two bad cases. Every day we arrest a lot of people and every day we also prevent a lot of and we, we disrupt. And I think this should also be an acknowledgement in, 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 a, in a difficult environment. But we are getting there. We need, of course, more. We need also more help. But we are getting there. Thank you. Anyone who wants to come in with questions? Yes, Miss. Uh. Um, I would like to 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 speak about the immigration. Immigration. And so I see. Um, Just, uh, oh, yes. A yes. Um, the most of people they are coming in the last time they are economical they are not political immigrants and what i think that in eu you don't have um, uh, a law or a, um, a category for this person uh, how i see this uh, economical immigrants i see that they can have a permit a temporary permit for three or six months uh, until the um, the condition in their countries uh, become better, uh, and um, that is, you know, and you we have uh, for the political immigrants. Uh, I think uh, that's a very good thing. Then uh, in uh, an European po uh, political asylum, that now I think that will be done. I heard about it. I don't know. I think that would be a very uh, good. Uh, 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 answer to this question. And I think that the immigrant and the European FBI think there are two different things, but they must be connected. Uh, the FBI, uh, European agency, that I think it will be very good. It's only for the, the crime, uh, crime and uh, uh, terrorists and all the things. And immigrants, um, they are a database that I see that this in connection with the other database, you know. So um, for me, immig immigration, if, if you have this, uh, this economical immigrant statute, uh, I think that it's not bad to, to uh, not be a problem, you know. That is mm. my, my opinion. Mm. And you have another one, the political asylum. Mr. Bray, by all means, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I think you're pointing to something that is quite important here, and that um, when we talk about the successes of the European Union in the area of justice and normal affairs, I wouldn't exactly put immigration policy at the forefront of any of these, because I think it is certainly one of the areas that we're lagging far behind. and. I'm saying that not just at the EU level, but even if you look at the national level and you look at actual immigration policies, um, you actually have the problem that in a lot of ways you don't fully have a policy. What you have is a kind of a patchwork of tolerations, a patchwork of, you know, in this particular case we do this, in this particular case we do that, but we don't have a fully coherent policy that serves a specific purpose. Now, in the United Kingdom, some of the debate has been leading towards, you know, we want a particular type of immigration. We want highly skilled migrants that contribute to the economy. At the same time, while this debate is going on, there's also another debate going on that is about we have too many foreigners in the country, generally speaking, uh, which kind of contradicts the first um, 
policy objective. So we're not certain yet what the policy, policy objective of an immigration policy is, not at a national level, not at the European level, and we don't have a fully developed policy that would, would lend itself to that. Now, when it comes to uh, asylum policy, I think we have come a long way. I think we're nowhere near where we should be, but we have come a long way compared to where we used to be, um, in that we have certain minimum standards that have increased um, the rights of asylum seekers and refugees in a number of countries and have raised standards. And I think the trend is certainly going to go even further towards that now with the increasing judicialization that I spoke about and the role of the European Court of Justice and European Court of Human Rights, the Charter of Fundamental Rights and so on. So we will certainly, in due course over the next years, we will have a more fully developed policy, partially um, a policy that will be adopted and partially a policy that will be you know, determined by the courts. Um, but in terms of uh, migration policy, we're not there yet and it's difficult to see how fast we will get there because the main obstacle to what's having a policy is the uh, acceptance that migration does happen and therefore you might create a policy that deals with that rather than a policy that primarily deals with you know, suggesting that, you know, migration is something that happens to the US or to Australia rather than Europe, because it does happen to Europe as well. So, um, and, and at the moment, we have a policy that is mainly suggestive that we don't. So, in that sense, I think there's a lot to do. <clears throat> okay, uh, do you want me to? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, okay, so on the... Uh, that's very interesting what, what Christian just said because I'd like to go a little bit more into detail on asylum. But before I do that, on the on the migration debate, of course, it's a very frustrating topic. It's as difficult here as it is. It, it's as difficult at the European level as it is the national level. And just to give you a quick shortcut, uh, if you don't work in migration, there are basically migration throughout history has never been something that politicians speak about. So there was never ever a moment in history that somebody, a politician, stood up on a box during election time and said, "Do you know what this country needs more of?" It needs more immigrants. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to let 50,000 more immigrants into the country. And nobody ever was going to go and vote for that guy or person. So th this is why immigration discussions take place behind closed doors. Of course, there is a means for granting access to countries. Immigration is certainly allowed and, uh, and often welcomed in times where you need a lot of labour, like the Gasterarbeiter who came to, to, to Germany and the Netherlands in the 70s. And uh, we're still sort of living with that legacy uh, uh, today. But the, the issue is, if you want to understand the issue a little better, it's this. Is there are three strands to the migration debate, there, and they never touch. There are three groups of people having this conversations about the same thing, but that never communicate directly to each other. The first is the media strand, basically, that the immigrants are, are flooding in the, coming in the floodgates and, and taking us all over and taking our jobs and our women and all this sort of stuff, okay? So there's that, there's that debate, okay? Now, that's obviously alarmist and over the top and often exaggerated and, and usually cast in the worst possible light. So uh, the second thing is the policy debate, where policymakers try and come up with genuinely clever ideas to manage a global phenomenon called migration better. That involves helping migrants uh, send, home, send home money easier, uh, getting agreements with uh, third countries on labour matching, uh, mutual recognition of diplomas, basically making sure that we understand each other as well as possible before the migrant actually arrives. So that's, you know, this helps with integration, it allows for more immigration because the public don't raise concerns, etc, etc. So that's the very sensible, nice strand of the debate that, that fortunately I am in most of the time. And the third one is the humanitarian debate, that basically immigrants have a, that migration is a human right, that immigrants have a right to cross borders, that nation states are essentially illegitimate or, or sub, subservient to that right, um, and that we need to be much more generous on asylum seekers. And this takes me on to, to the point on asylum. I, I absolutely subscribe to the need to provide international protection, and, and Europe has a wonderful tradition of that. In fact, Europe is the most generous provider of asylum in the world. Uh, and particularly North European countries shelter the majority of migrants or asylum seekers uh, of anywhere in the world. Uh, so basically between 
the US, Canada, ourselves, we shelter the, the majority of the world's uh, asylum seekers. The issue is, how do you make the rest of the world respect the Geneva Convention? How do you make the rest of the world provide protection, uh, which is not currently available to them under the Geneva Convention, or who don't take it very seriously? Uh, one vital element in this strand is Turkey. Turkey doesn't actually have a functioning asylum system, uh, even though it has a long history of providing shelter under its own terms. But Turkey never signed up to vari uh, various parts of the G Geneva Convention, and that's why if we were to have an, a new treaty with Turkey on, on visa liberalisation, an absolute quid pro quo is that they've set up a European-style asylum system. And that means that the, since the majority of people... Remember how, how difficult the asylum issue is politically. When the Franco-Italian affair happened, uh, it, it was immediately mitigated by the reality that a lot of the Tunisians were not applying for asylum. And this made the North European countries and the Italians, it made them much more, much calmer. Because asylum is, uh, it's a very expensive and difficult process to process an asylum seeker, to accommodate them. They can't enter the labour market, you see. So this, this allows the sort of public debate to get much more difficult. It's very easy to brand somebody who can't work as a scrounger. And it undermines basically the whole system of asylum, which we have to keep political consent for the asylum system in, high in Europe, especially when you consider that so few other parts of the world provide asylum. It has to be a major plank of our foreign policy to, to get countries to, to take the Geneva Convention more seriously. That, may, that will make it a less difficult political issue at home. That will allow us to continue providing high standards of uh, protection, uh, etc., etc. So there's a, there's a whole... You could study the asylum issue on its own, as many people do, uh, you know, just on its own as regards the future of Schengen. The, the reality is that the Dublin arrangements uh, that, that hold up the European asylum system are a vital foundation stone. They made the Schengen area politically possible. They were agreed before the Schengen area was agreed. And if, it comes, if they come apart, the whole Schengen area is, is, is undermined to a degree. Because few things make national interior ministries more nervous than you know, this, this issue. Uh, just to, to speak to Christiane's point is that I think a more sensible way to have the migration debate would be when we can join up, when policymakers can join up three elements of, of the migration debate. One is the desire to migrate, because Europe has the world's highest standard of living, more or less. And we will, given income disparities, we will always, and our demographics, we will always attract uh, migrants. And we'll be attracting many more in the years to come, as you or I don't have a lot of children and we have to, uh, we have to, to, to find skilled and talented workers. Uh, where I'm a little bit uh, uh, worried about the, the, the sort of debates over just highly skilled workers is that the chief benefit of immigration is that, look at the way the US handles things. You, you can't underestimate the regenerative force of a young, poor immigrant who is determined to succeed. Immigrants have founded uh, companies like Google, PayPal, all the sort of new fancy glitzy companies have all been founded by immigrants and they accounted for 60%, 67% of growth in the US sci science and engineering workforce. Uh, but you've no way of knowing that before the person arrives. You know, this is the, the, the time that the returns from immigration work to a far longer time span than electoral politics, sadly. And that's what makes the immigration so, more, so much more difficult. So in, in, in the paper, I allude to, to, you know, just I try and show the way. I can't come up with the solution because it's so difficult. What, we have to find a way to join up the European welfare state, which is the real border in Europe. You know, access to the welfare state is what is, is wanted and is what is most worried about. Uh, the desire to migrate and the need for foreign labour. We have to link those things up somehow. And that's the matrix that we're working in. That's the matrix that we're going to have to think in. It's not a simple answer to, to, to that problem, but it's... It is the major issue, politically. Jan, you had a question. Uh, no, I was uh, tempted to ask a question about Bulgaria and uh, Romania. From your point of view, should we ad uh, admit them to the Schengen area under the present circumstances, or should we postpone it for a while? Well, I don't think I am going to be invited to Bucharest or Sofia anytime soon, but uh, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to say. But the reality is, is that the, Schengen, the, the argument is this, that they have completed the technical criteria and therefore under EU law should be allowed to join the Schengen area as this is only fair. However, given the potential to trigger a second far more that will make the Franco-Italian affair seem like nothing, uh, and the problem is that once people start panicking about immigration, then they start doing stupid things. Like, nobody can actually explain why the uh, Franco-Italian affair required a reform of the Schengen system, which I uh, actually feel is the Schengen Convention, for example, is an amazing treaty. It, read it compared to the Lisbon Treaty, it's, it's poetry. You know, it's clear, it's precise, it knows what it wa wants, it's implementable. 
Um, so I'm, I'm very wary of messing with a system which I think is actually quite done quite well, but I do see the need for some reforms. The, if you ask me, are, is the border on Ro Romania and Bulgaria secure? It's secure, but it is corrupt. Um, you know, the signs of corruption dot the Hungarian or the Bulga Romanian and Bulgarian uh, border areas, and they, they, even to the degree where there's a popular joke. You know, what do you give a border guard on his birthday? And the answer is a shift on his own. Basically, it means a chance to engage in corrupt activities. Now, there are, you know, there are there are various ways around this issue. I mean, to say that the member states don't take this seriously or it's not a real issue is not true. They have quietly slipped a clause on corruption into Croatia's accession treaty, which means that Croatia will have to satisfy these concerns before it can join. So no corruption on the border with Croatia. And let's, let's remember, guys, under Transparency International's sort of global index on, cor on corruption, Croatia is less corrupt than Bulgaria and Romania. Um, then, but, it, but we can't, because of the EU processes, etc., do the same in the case of those two. And I'm afraid I would ask, I would appeal to, the, to those countries to show some, some leadership. I know that they are eager to have their rights. I am sympathetic to it. Um, but if, what is the point in joining a, the, a passport-free area if, if all you do is trigger a greater crisis in it, if, you, if it perhaps leading to its fragmentation? Because remember, before there was Schengen, there were other free movement zones. There was the Nordic Passport Union. Uh, there was the Benelux arrangements. You know, I mean, my fear is that for a while, we might have a fragmentation of, into, into zones. You could have Schengen North, for example, Schengen South. Um, and you know, that, that is, it's, a, it's a real fear. And in my view, we, we don't have to keep them out for a crazy am amount of time. If we can get Greece sorted out until 2014, or if we can get a new set of rules that allow us to suspend Greece, because Greece has not been very receptive, it also has very difficult problems. This has to be said. It is, it is, how can it establish a new border force at a time when its budgets are being cut under the terms of its Eurozone uh, deal? You know, this is very, very difficult. And I've outlined a number of, it's very technical, but I've outlined a number of solutions I think would work. If we don't fix Greece, we have to fix Greece to undo the original sin of the Schengen area. Uh, and I suppose also in the Eurozone. Uh, and or, Bulgaria and Romania could join tomorrow if Greece wasn't there. But Greece is there. And uh, I think so that we can all stay together as a family, we're going to have to make some difficult compromises. Right, I don't hold strong views in the sense that um, uh, I was relatively convinced by the arguments that you made. Um, the only thing that I'd be worried if, if there's an increasing trend of, you know, uh, moving the goalpost, that could... Um, Yes, then in that sense we kind of undermine the faith in, you know, for future countries wanting to make difficult reforms in order to enter Schengen. If we keep, and I know it's, it, it can create problems, and I think I'm convinced by your argument in terms of um, the problems that can be created by Greece. At the same time, I'm also a little bit wary of pointing about corruption problems only to Romania and Bulgaria because we do have member states already inside the Schengen system that I would have thought are not a million miles away from Romania and Bulgaria in terms of corruption. Um, uh, just, you know, without pointing the finger to Italy, I can still uh, just mention an anecdote that the majority of um, renting in Florence is still done in cash payments. Um, and it is sometimes not so easy to convince landlords to provide receipts for those cash payments. <laughs> so um, if, if we want to talk about corruption, I think we have a number of countries also inside the European Union and inside the Schengen area that I would have thought are not a million miles away from the corruption problem that we have there. Now, um, how, what does it mean towards Schengen? I think it's a difficult decision. I would probably eventually come down on um, allowing Romania and Bulgaria to come in on the basis that I think in the long run moving the goalpost could, under, could undermine uh, the system more than um, the problems that we're going to find and that we're going to have to deal with when they do join, even though I'm convinced that, that you have a point there. Yeah, just on the, on the corruption, what we need to do when we, when we reform Schengen, there's no proposal for this yet, we need to include corruption as, at the border as one of the criteria in the, in the Schengen evaluations. So we need to reform the evaluation system. Uh, peer to, countries, countries reporting on each other hasn't worked. 
So we need to move away from that. Remember, this is all about confidence, not about the actual numbers or problems, unless there are very serious problems. Um, on the corruption at the border, it's of course just Bulgaria and Romania are just two countries amongst many. Uh, if, uh, Finland and Germany, for example, uh, two countries who have sterling reputations on corruption issues. Well, you remember Joska Fischer uh, had a very serious drama in 2005 when the uh, German embassy in Kiev was found to be issuing visas in a very strange manner indeed, uh, uh, to, to a degree that the German security officials say that a great degree of organised crime actually entered the country uh, because there was the, basically there was a scam going on because Joska Fischer tried to do something very idealistic. He said, we need to be moving further to these countries that want to adopt democracy as their model. One of the things I'm going to do is relax visa uh, requirements. But this had a strange effect on the, on the embassy in Kiev and they began to do strange things. Uh, the relaxation of the regime, in other words, allowed some corruption in. Um, also, in the case of Finland, there have been actions taken against somebody who was issuing visas for money. Visas for money. If, every, if people want a Schengen visa, is already very, very difficult to get. Some say too difficult. Um, but there, there, there's temptation. There's the temptation to corruption everywhere in the in the uh, system because entry is so valuable, and therefore people who are not well paid or think they're not well paid will always be tempted. So if this is a criteria in the evaluations, this will greatly strengthen the system. Uh, so you don't. It's not just about the uh, the countries that we have lots of stereotypes and cliches about for sure. And I wouldn't like that to to to, to be set in your minds. Okay, I think uh, we have come to the end of uh, this afternoon. I have found it myself a very interesting discussion. The question was, uh, does Europe need an uh, FBI? I think the first speaker already had a very sobering thought. The present treaty doesn't allow it. So if we wanted to have it, we have to change the treaty. And uh, yeah, that is, I'm not sure if the mood for that is right at the moment. So. With that in mind, I think several speakers have underlined that we can much, do much to improve the present coordination. And uh, the problem of languages is mentioned, and et cetera. So reinforce the existing institutions and try to let them function better. That is the, the recipe, more or less, that came out this afternoon, as far as I can see it. I found it interesting that um, a lot of people mentioned as well cyber crime that it needed more attention and it was a relatively cheap method as well and even it was said that if in the time of budgetary restraint it would uh, give us more benefit than it would cost in the investment and i think that is something we have to uh, keep in mind one of the thoughts that was uttered as well and that stuck in my mind is that the border control is completely european frontex we have outside borders almost no inside borders anymore but that is not, like with the monetary policy, not accompanied by a security policy at all. And I think that we have to keep in mind, we cannot have one or the other, we must have both. Um, 